Hi. All right, recording. Hi, good evening, okay. everybody. Thank you for coming to another webinar. And this is the first webinar that we're having on hematology. And of course, um, Dr. Harris, um, if you do not know yet, he has his own channel and he has his own platform. Uh, it's called, what is it called? Uh, Dr. Uh, Paka Dara Anda. Paka Dara Anda. And this, yeah, we'll um, talk about it later, yeah. Yeah, it's, he's been very diligent and I'm trying to learn how to do it from him, but I've still so far failed because he has been posting a lot on it. We'll speak about it later. Maybe we'll just um, sure. yeah, talk about what we need to speak about first. Mm. I'm very, very um, actually inspired by your no, page, you know, you know, your work that you put in. It's just very, very amazing. Okay, so you can share your slides. Uh, okay. As you may know, Dr. Harris is actually a hematologist, a consultant hematologist with the private hospital. Okay. And uh, he was previously mm. with, in university hospital. Oh, I think um, apparently there's a, there's a block there because um, previously because you're recording, so I cannot share. So yeah, I'm can, just going can. to... Yeah, I'm just can going share. to, yeah, from, from my end. So, okay. How come? Huh? Right. Cannot, can share. Yeah. Everybody has shared before. You try and see yeah. because I've already put Okay, done already. Okay, yeah. uh, done now. Okay, so here we go. Okay, can okay. you see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm right. just going to play this. Akadara Anda. Yeah, that's it. Okay, all right. So it's full screen, right? So um, shall we just see the flavor first and then we'll take it from there if everyone's okay all right so i think betty mentioned that um, my, my specialty is mainly clinical hematology uh, with most of the hematologists we did training in um, in multiple areas and my background is i actually got lab certification as well as the clinical certification so um, when i was doing my training i had to do a bit of pathology i have to do a bit of the clinical stuff and part of the clinical training I have to do um, at least about nine nine uh, six months of icu because there's a lot of uh, quite intensive training involved in clinical hematology because of the transplantation and all that. So there's a lot of facet to it. So, sorry, can you hear me? Okay, Um. so hmm. let me just, uh, can I ask you, hmm, uh, sure. when you say that you, you are both a clinical hematologist and also you have lab yeah. hematology, is there a difference? Um, can you tell us well, more? Well, you, when you do your... Um, MRCP, um, and then you do your further training post MRCP yes. uh, to become a hematologist. There are many pathways. Um, so the local pathway for the hematology training is that's actually uh, being uh, run under the Malaysian Society of Hematologists, where they actually have a three plus one year training program. So after you've done your master's or your MRCP, you get enrolled into the training program. So you're either going to be based in uh, KKM or in uh, one of the universities. Uh, this is a post, um, post um, your master's or MRCP. So this an extra four years on top of your specialist training. So after you got gazetted, so you get into this training program. The, the path that I uh, went through was uh, after my MRCP, I did my training in the UK. So I had to go through the FRC path, pathway. So I came back. I uh, already got a bit of pathology, a bit of hematology. I see. Sorry? So you do have to do, uh, you you actually have a hmm. FRC path. Yeah, we, we got a, a lab license as well. That's why I, I have... A, I, I'm actually uh, what uh, the lab manager for two of the hospitals under the under the uh, um, uh, under the Samdabi group. Okay, so lab means uh, both you can do pathology lab and also mm. uh, um, pathology lab. Yes, yeah. Can you but do uh, clinician. even chemistry lab? No. Mine is uh, because when you do your CPAT, you have to decide whether you want to become 
what I subspecialty see. you want to become. So you can either become the chemical pathologist, but mine sub, my sub is just for uh, hematopathologists. So blood bank, blood banking, and then uh, I can report certain uh, that obviously the bone marrow slides and, and things like that. So it's a different kind of subspecialty on top of the clinical, clinical training work. that we had to do. Yeah. So That's it's a bit, it's a bit long. Yeah. So we're just going to talk about basically, you know, the blood bank stuff, not, not in yes. great details. Like it's basically when uh, blood banking is actually something mysterious. And in, in Malaysia, it's actually run the, by the pathologist. In the UK, uh, actually, it's a mixed picture. And um, usually the clinician actually run the blood bank in the UK compared to here. Here, it's mainly just pathologists. So that's why uh, people in the clinical side uh, do not actually engage much with uh, with the blood bank. So obviously, when you need blood product and things like that, you you call the lab and everything. So, but there's always a, a, a sometimes a disconnect because you don't share information. Sometimes uh, the information that the blood bank um, specialist wants, um, the the clinician might not be able to provide. So. Sometimes there's there's a bit of bridging needs to be needs to be done in terms of the communication. So there are certain things about blood products sometimes remains a mystery for the clinician. But we the purpose of this discussion is just trying to 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 give some flavor about you know when you donate blood, what happened to the blood, and then we'll take it from there. Lah. So it's an okay. open-ended thing. So I have a few pictures, you know, while I was actually in the blood bank. So this is actually, as you can see on the on the screen now. So this actually straight away this is a fresh out of the oven, if you can call a person an oven. Lah. <laughs> so just just got got from from the patient. So if you donated blood before, when when um, the blood product comes out from your arm, uh, you got a few uh, system when it comes to the bags. And the one that um, I'm I tend to use here, even in my blood bank, is actually the the two bag system at least. So in the bag, there is actually some uh, preservative that we call sagum. This, this preservative makes sure that um, when the blood gets separated, it doesn't get lysed, but you have to do it very quickly within, ideally within two or three days, it should be separated already. So once the blood actually leaves the body, it starts to degrade. So um, if you do not separate the component quickly, you lose certain components, especially the platelet. Platelet is very precious. So you try to actually process it quickly so that you can get the platelet. And the platelet also, there's a couple of ways to actually extract platelet. So we just this is the general one. You know, when you go to shopping mall or something like that, there's, there's a blood drive going on. So they take the blood in a bag. But the bag actually is attached to two smaller bags to it. So this is what the purpose of the smaller bag. So this is the blood being weighed and it's weighed in a pair. So this is one pair, that's the other pair. Why? Because the next step would be, it's going to be put into a centrifuge. So each pair, so this is, a, I think a six column centrifuge. So the pair that have been weighed are put in, uh, this is column four and column one over here. So they have to be the same weight because otherwise, terbang lah everything. So this is weighed against this one. So when you weigh them, you try to balance them, you put in certain cuttings here. This cutting is actually just to balance it. I see. So, yeah, so that the weight is the same on all six components. So when you actually centrifuge, it's balanced. So the, the actual centrifuge doesn't actually break because it goes about 2,000 ref, you know, so it's quite so quick. So let's say when you have hmm. um, a drive, let's say a blood, donation mm. drive this centrifuge machine will also go to the oh no net. no no this is oh. actually in the lab oh, so, in the lab. so how for how what is the time frame mm. that from the mm. collection actually yeah. needing to be mm. centrifuge i think ideally as, as as i mentioned just now the longer you wait the more platelet you lose you won't lose the red blood you won't lose the plasma but the platelet you lose. So ideally you want to do it at the latest the next morning. So you get it, you, you get it, you collect it, you bring to the lab. Usually you spin it either that night or the next morning. 
Okay, not immediately, mm. like within minutes or within a few uh, if hours. It's, well, if it's in the lab, uh, if it's in the blood bank, oh, you can do it as long as you got enough co enough blood, enough component to slots, then you just spin it straight away. So you can do it almost straight away. So when you spin it, this is pre-spun. This is after you spin. So once you spun the blood, uh, it, it separates into two main components. So the, the bottom one is actually the pack cell. And the top here is actually a mixture of plasma with some platelet. And this is puffy coat. Puffy coat is actually white cell. This patient actually got a bit of high cholesterol on it. I think you probably need to see you, uh, Betty, this patient. Okay. Got a bit of cholesterol, <laughs> can refer to you. But obviously, I don't know who the donor is, the, the donor is because it's confidential. Ma. So when they come in, so this patient definitely got a bit of triglycerides. La. So this is oh, the... Oh, I see. It can obviously see. Uh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. No fresh after you spun. Uh. So this is... Um, the white cell is just a minor thing. So this is actually the... the uh, pack cell, the red blood, and then the top bit here, including everything, we call this uh, platelet-rich plasma, because a bit of plasma, a bit of platelet, and many, many stuff. Lah. So what you do, you squeeze the blood. So you put it in the squeezer. The old method is you actually practically squeeze it, but the modern one is a machine. So the machine got a sensor here. So the moment that it detects there is actually cell, it stops. So initially, brings the net, it squeeze, squeeze. So when it squeeze, the plasma go out first, and then there will be the pack cell. When it reaches here, it stops. The top bit will be this back. So you squeeze from the component. So this is actually the platelet-rich plasma that's been squeezed out from here. So you squeeze it in. So this one goes up, leaving you with the pack cell and the top there. This is just a warmer because platelet degrades very quickly otherwise. So you want to keep it at least about room temperature. Lah. So, so if that's it, I want whole blood, whole blood. Mm. Oh, whole blood. Um, you tend to actually, this, oh, sorry. Uh, wrong button, uh, this blood, this thing. So some of them are not spun for whole blood. So whole blood just, um... Yeah. Don't do no need to do anything. No need to do anything, but you need a pilot component for cross match. So there is the pilot component is actually this bit here. So you actually can clip it so that uh, when you clip the pilot component here, uh, you don't expose the rest of the blood. Um, yeah. So it's very difficult to explain um, without without the pictures lah. So this one, this white, uh, this this blood column is actually quite long. So okay, uh, pointer, when we, yeah, so no, because ideally it should be, it should be the gamba should be clear, um, include the top component here. So I just oh, I see, take I see, the picture here. So when you so do cross match, you take the sample you, from here, you take kacau the back. Hmm. How many, how many, how do you decide or the bullet hmm. rank decide how many percent of blood spun and it's not, and then how many percent goes as oh um usually depends on the demand um in in most places the problem with uh with whole blood is we try not to use or dispense whole blood as much as we can because we want a bit we want plasma we want platelet I because see. because if you give whole blood the platelet component in there or the plasma in there is basically just volume it doesn't function for it to actually function well, especially the platelet, you have to separate it because it gets activated very quickly. So when you give whole blood, it's just purely for volume. Oh, okay. But for clotting, you have to give the component ideally. So when you squeeze the blood, as I mentioned, so this here is the, plus, um, is the platelet rich plasma, not pure plasma yet, not pure platelet yet. What do you do after that? You spin again. So you spin this time around, there will be some sedimentation at the bottom. That's where your platelet concentrate is. And then this is the fresh. This is actually plasma. Fresh frozen plasma is when you're frozen it already. Lah. So you separate them into this uh, fresh plasma, not yet frozen. This is the platelet concentrate. 
Okay, so for the platelet concentrate, for the platelet that we use, so this is one adult volume. You can actually keep it. You cannot freeze it. It lasts only about three to five days. So you, once you actually have it, you actually have to keep it very quickly and just try to actually dispense it. So as you see the volume there, it's about 50 mils. This one is about 200 mils. Okay, so, oh, sorry. Those are not important others. Okay, so um, so this is actually the the gist of it in terms of the components. Lah. Nothing magical about it. Um, but we try to actually keep the components separately because the plasma we can keep for a long time. So um, with one unit of blood that people donate, you can basically use it to transfuse to three people. But if oh. you just use one, uh, if you just give a whole blood, only one people gets it. I see. Okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. So basically, All it right. is. Let's say there is a patient with bleeding, and you want to give blood. Mm -hmm. Then it is um, it is worthwhile to give back cells and give volume in let's say mm -hmm. saline or. Yeah, either like ojala funding or depends on how. How you want to expand the volume? Some plasma expander, basically. Hmm. Now, uh, is that all the slides you have? So, oh no, there's there's a bit more about the the plasma component. Okay. Just um, just move that first line. Okay. So, um, there's a couple of kinds of platelet. Okay, the one that we collect just now, these are okay. just, uh platelet concentrate. The one that we separated from the whole blood just now. So the one that we 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 actually collect, but from one donor, we can only give uh, we can only get one platelet um, unit. And this one platelet concentrated unit is only good at increasing about five to ten uh, um, times the power of nine like in terms of the amount. So basically, uh, if the start off point of the patient is say the platelet is 10. If you give two pints, uh, two units, it goes up to about 20 theoretically. But in actual fact, it's not, uh, it, there's many factors that actually determine how good the response is. If the patient is uh, been, been transfused a lo lot of times before, they tend to actually have some um, degree of alloimmunity. So they don't actually have a good plus, um, platelet increment. But the one that's never had any platelet uh, transfusion before, they can just shoot up very nicely. On an average, it's 5 to 10 per, per, uh, per unit. So in a typical adult uh, transfusion, we give 4 to 6 units. That's a platelet concentrate. So it can go up to about 40. Usually 40 is enough for hemostasis already. Lah. You can always give more after that. And uh, the one that we tend to use as alternative is actually the single donor platelet. So the single donor platelet is different from platelet concentrate in the sense that when you go for platelet transfusion, there's two advantages if you just collect platelet. Uh, the first one is uh, you get, get the platelet out via uh, apheresis method. So the patient is like having dialysis, like, so to speak. I so see. They, so you don't they, actually donate the whole blood cells? No. No, you just actually uh, take usually you run uh, every 100 mils, 50 to 100 mils into the, into the machine. You spin it out in real time, extract the platelet, and then put back the plasma and the, the, the pack cell back into the I patient in circuit. So okay. you just out and in, out spin, in, out spin, in. So usually you can get uh, one uh, uh, one. Uh, donation uh, visit, the amount that we collect is usually enough for about six to eight uh, random platelet uh, amount. But the advantage of it is you're exposing the patient to just one donor. If you use smaller platelet concentrate, say if you're using a six um, unit of uh, platelet concentrate, you're exposing the patient to six donors. If six so donors, that, then the, the yeah. level that goes up will be less than if it's a single donor. Um, uh, yes, because uh, in terms of the concentrate is less, uh, mm -hmm. the platelet is being processed already. Once you squeeze the platelet out using that method just now, once the platelet is swimming inside the plasma, it gets activated. 
Mm. So that's why the, the, the shelf life is actually very short. But what we are more concerned is the exposure to the patient. So for the amount of platelet increment, if you use a single donor platelet, the, platelet, the patient is only exposed to one donor. While so if, if you're you're using, exposed to multiple donors, what will mm. happen again? Can you okay. explain the risk, again? The, okay, if you have been exposed to multiple donors, huh? number one, obviously, the screening process has to be more rigorous. Kalau one of the patient already got hepatitis or things like that, obviously, the, the okay. risk of infection is higher. Number two is uh, the allo immunization. Um, basically, if you have the blood group as A, B, A positive, that's just one component of blood grouping. We have about 25. So they have uh, the ABO group and then the resus group, obviously, the plus and minus okay. can. And then you also got your MNN and then you've got your Duffy, you got many kinds of it. So if you are exposed to multiple transfusion where, uh, where you are not actually have that subtype of blood group, you will get allo immunization as you go along. Imagine if you are a patient with uh, with leukemia, for example, you're getting three times a week blood transfusion. So if you are getting it from a different donor, not a single donor platelet, in one week alone, you've been exposed to at least 20 donors, you know, because you get back cell also for another donor, you got platelet. Uh, one day you get six donor actually in your body. So imagine by the time you have your treatment, you're in hospital for about three weeks, uh, one week, you're exposed to 20 donors. Ayo, you imagine, lah, satu kali chemo, you're exposed to 50 donors already. So basically, so you those are form the reason reactions. Why. Mm. So uh, Andre you says... You form allo immunity, you warm antibody. Mm. I see. And what yeah. will happen if that happens? Mm. When you form... Yeah. And then after a while, you... You form antibodies against blood transfusion, and then you you will notice that if you give platelet, the response is not as good, and there okay. will come a time where you need to give a type specific single donor platelet, and that's a nightmare. So you try to avoid it. So from the very beginning, those that needs multiple transfusion, we try to actually use single donor platelet instead. The problem with single donor platelet is also the cost, because for one single donor platelet unit. My hospital probably charge about one thousand four hundred ringgit. You know, it's very See, expensive SDP. Yeah. Why is it so expensive? So, it's because of the technique that you have. The to machine, use. the technique. Yes, the technique, the tubing that we use, and also the um, the um, the the screening should not be a problem because um, the the screening is actually less on the patient. It's mainly the the amount of uh, work that goes into in terms of the, the processing and the and the tubing lah. because the machine itself is actually a separate machine it's not just a normal donation okay but andre you know, asked if sure. he can positive... ask directly can yes andre uh, you know andre uh, right you know yeah, andre yeah, yeah. I, if... yeah i think uh, i think i um his wife also works the wife also a doctor you know the wife story. of well, have you been in SGMC for so long? Sorry? My wife yeah. is Vanessa. Yeah, Sorry? of course. The wife is my good friend. Yeah, yeah but I didn't realize that the wife left a long time ago. Uh, oh. I thought that you, you when you came, the wife was not working there anymore. Oh, so been, Andre been asked... Actually, you, 10 years. La. <laughs> yeah, but I thought the wife left a long time ago. Uh. If uh, oh, okay. if no. okay, so, so his question. Andre, Andre, just ask a question, lah. Senang, yeah. Oh yeah, Andre, you can. I, I can't see the screen, lah. Oh, in I, emergency, I, when we give, hmm. um, we don't have O negative, research negative. Hmm. So sometimes ah. we have to give O positive blood. Hmm. Um, so if in the scenario of a male or a female, and we give hmm. such blood hmm. for the first uh, round of transfusion, so do we need to take any special um interventions? Because and can we, we, we follow not, up with a group specific yeah, after that? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the thing is, you can at least get the type within half an hour. Lah. So by the time you are finished transfusion, your, your bag, we should know the, 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 the group of the donor already. Sometimes you're in, in an emergency, right? You just grab an own O positive, just give to the to the patient. By the time that transfusion finished, you should be able to actually at least know whether the patient is positive or negative. 
That's the only information that you need to find out. Because if the blood is positive, the recipient is negative, there will be um, the need to actually give anti D. So, give what? Sorry, give what again? Anti D. Anti D, the, the recess, the rogum, basically. So, the one that's available. do we need mm. to give to males or what about um, uh, timing of giving? Mm -hmm. Within six hours, so it's okay. So, you, you, you have time to act. If so is it gender recipient, related? Uh, no, because the Andre, you want asking whether male or female. The mother, so if they get a low in yeah, yeah, because it's important question. Because if the definitely you if a mother is allo immunized with anti D, the patient is actually recess negative. The next pregnancy. If the baby is recess positive, it's going to be in trouble, isn't it? Because you have anti-D immunization, uh, allo immunization against your, your baby. So the main, um, the main issue or the main importance why we try and do a mismatch is because so we don't like want yeah? allo immunity developing huh? in the... Oh, so you hear me? It's fine. Can you, I can, can you, yeah, I can hear you. Speak and see. Okay. So, uh, it's, think, uh, I, I need to move my door. Okay, two seconds. Okay. 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 If you Is have any better? question. Okay. 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 Uh, going back to what Andre was asking. So, a okay. very important thing. Um, obviously, you don't want anybody to develop anti-D. So anti D happens if you are recess negative, you receive a product that is recess positive. So you are actually uh, mounting an antibody against recess or D. It's it can be very violent if you are to receive a positive blood following in, uh, allo immunization later. So in mothers, say a uh, uh, recess negative mother, a lady was given a recess positive uh, blood inadvertently and she develops anti-D when she pre is pregnant and the baby happens to be recess negative, that's where the problem comes in. So at so, least nowadays, we can uh, uh, prevent the development of the antibody by giving rogum. By giving a? To the mother. Rogum, which is an anti-D. I see. So mm. what is the adverse effect for the baby? Oh, the baby actually uh, is like a ca catastrophic transfusion reaction to the baby. It's hemo hemolysis that is actually, you can't stop. Mm. See? Yes. So it's something that that, that you don't wish to, to, to happen to yes. anyone. Yeah. And it can happen not just to the baby, so to the mother as well. Say, if it's actually exposed to, uh, sorry, the if there is actually a breach where the baby is recess positive, the spillover from the baby's blood into the mother, as you can imagine, the mother will mount a reaction against the anti D that the the, the baby actually produce. What about so, for male? Huh? What would you do? No. Uh, you can still give rogum within six hours. There is actually a time frame. It takes a while for you to develop the anti D. So by the time you finish the time, you have to save life anyway, right? So you have to give whatever product that you have. So it doesn't matter if the patient is actually anti D, but you know, you have to actually reverse the, the process as quickly as you can. So this is for rhesus. So rhesus um, is more how you call it detrimental if we give it wrongly, yeah. right? Uh, ABO, if, definitely catastrophic if you got a mismatch, but you have to understand the, the biology of the ABO mismatch because it's not, um, it's, say if you are an O, you are actually a universal donor, but you cannot receive anything but O. In AB, you can receive anything, but your blood is basically, can only be received by somebody with AB. We understand all that. We understand hmm. a lot of, I mean, yeah. vaguely, because what I've studied before, mm -hmm. of course, uh, ABO and then the research, but I have hmm. 
forgotten or maybe I never even knew, uh, what are the reactions all this mismatch? And in your clinical practice, what is the most common cause of mismatch? Oh, mismatch. Um, well, I think the the main issue is the alloimmune the, the the antibody obviously if it's if it's a different blood group that you actually give a wrong blood group because of somebody makes a mistake then obviously that's one of it but that's sometimes uh, there are safeguards against it hopefully it doesn't happen but what can sometimes happen is if the patient actually got alloimmunity because uh, been exposed to certain blood product where they've developed antibody and there has actually a slight change in their blood parameters. So previously, say if they are actually exposed to an, um, if the patient stay, one of the blood group is called Duffy. So if it's Duffy negative, he receive a Duffy positive blood, so he will make an anti-Duffy. So there will be a reaction the next time he receive a Duffy positive blood. So during the cross match, if there is actually antibody against Duffy, the subsequent transfusion, he must receive a Duffy negative. So those are the kind of safeguards that we have to do in terms of cross matching. So that's why it's a bit of a pain, you know, when, when we, we sometimes we want to transfuse blood and, and the blood bank came on asking, Ayo, we have to do cross match within 72 hours. So every time you actually had a blood transfusion, you will actually expose yourself to a new antibody. So there will be some degree of low immunization. So that's why the cross match is done before every transfusion, because you never know when you produce blood. When you transfuse platelet or plasma, mm. is yeah. there a chance that this ABO mm. resists? Uh, yeah. We never screen yeah. for plasma and yeah, yeah. Platelet, because right? because the antibody only uh, present on the red cell surface. I see. No. Is there so a chance that this plasma, red blood cell will not be segregated? Yes, exactly. Yet? Exactly. There will be some, but hopefully not as much as if you were giving pure red cell. So I there see. still can be some reaction if it's given, but um, there are a few ways to attenuate it. Either you give using filters or you actually give um, what you call this. Uh, you can reduce it by using um, uh, radiation. But filters is quite important. Uh, is quite useful in making sure that you don't get any red cell that is actually left sometimes contaminating your blood product. Hmm. Can I just ask you, Rogam is not easily available and for males, yeah. we rarely give Rogams. Exactly. Uh, so what will happen? Uh, what should we do in case they need to uh, have further transfusions? Uh, um, um, they, give, they, they have to have a, a negative blood from then on. Okay, so mm. we have to be very careful. The yes, next, next so you, you only got one chance. So once they actually have an anti-D, uh, after this subsequent, you have to give negative lah. Die, die negative juga. Mm, because it's not easily mm. available, Rogam. That's the most... thing. Because in Malaysia, there's not Rogam, many I'm negative. So sorry. Oh, that's, that, that's actually a trade name of a product. It's R-H-O-G-E-M. R-H-O-G-E-M. It's actually a, a antibody. In Malaysia, because there's less than five, about less than 10% of people actually resess negative. So that's why we don't keep it regular, uh, readily. So, um, can you read so Rogan, the message? Yeah, so ro the Rogan basically it just wipes out whatever um, it's neutralized the the uh, whatever anti well the the uh, red cell that is actually gone into the system. So they deactivate the the antibody so that our own body doesn't make an anti D. So that's what Rogam does. Rogam actually comes in, neutralize the the um, the antibody, the the positive um, um, antibody on the red cell surface of the donor, not the recipient uh, from the donor. So you give Rogam, deactivates it, so that the recipient doesn't mount an antibody reaction, so it doesn't develop um, alloimmunity against recess. So he will stay recess negative. So that's that's the idea of giving rogam. Okay, do you have more slides? Um just the plasma and then ah and then the plasma, the fresh frozen plasma. 
Okay, I just Sorry, before you go, can I just ask you, what's your definition of fresh uh, whole blood? How many hours? Do you, is there a definition mm. for fresh whole blood? No, no. Yeah, not not really strictly because um, it's actually the, the the component we try to actually if you want to actually separate the blood um, into the components you have to do it quickly. So if you decide that um, you're not going to separate it, you actually release it as whole blood. So, so when we say fresh whole blood, is there a time duration? Oh, a fresh fresh means unprocessed. So. Um, it's it doesn't mean that it's fresh as in just from the donor it comes in. Oh. It's not. It means that it's not been separated into into the component. So whole blood that's fresh blood like Basically, that's that's what it means. Mm. I'm uh, asking this that, because yeah. the mm. latest in trauma they are trying to move mm. towards fresh whole yeah. blood, but yeah. there's no clear definition and there's no clear exactly. Uh, and it depends on whether you got a blood bank or not at your center, isn't it? So right. uh, it's just just fresh blood. Basically, if you give a fresh, they they felt that not only that you get the benefit of the volume, you can actually have some benefit of the uh, of the um, clotting component as well. So that if you in a trauma situation, you got exposure of the of the tissue factors, and also you actually um, running the risk of developing coagulate. Coagulopathy already because you are actually giving a lot of transfusion. The patient is bleeding actively, so the IC is just around the corner. So um, in the trauma, if you give um, not giving whole blood or you are actually giving pack cell, you have to supplement it with FFP. But in fresh blood, the the risk of the IC is a bit less, but still after about six units of whole blood, you have to give some FFP because the worry is you develop a consumptive coagulopathy if you don't do that. Can we have um, like a rough idea how much mm -hmm. blood is given a day in Malaysia? Let's say in Malaysia. How much oh, of blood product I don't, is... Don't, yeah, I... No, I don't have that data actually. I don't think it's readily available. They have, they have the data for years and things like that. Um, but I don't, I don't have those those data readily because I never work in um in Pusat Dara and and places like that. And this Pusat Even Dara in, is under KKM, right? Yes, Pusat Dara is under KKM. And for example, uh, uh some big hospital have their own blood mm, bank. Does, yes. How closely mm. do they work with Pusat mm. Dara? Uh, like in SJMC, our blood bank capacity, we can only supply to about 30 to 40% of our own demand. So we still rely heavily on Pusat Darah Negara for the component. So mm. the supply still comes from Pusat Darah Negara. Yes. yes, we have to still play nice with them. Yeah, you have to play. <laughs> Yes, it's, 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 very, um, it's very important to have a network because um, there are certain... Uh, certain uh, times where uh, it's not just blood that you're giving. If you have um, time, I'm just going to show you. Uh, so this is just now looking at the platelet. Remember when we were talking about the FFP just now? The FFP, before we, uh, when, before we freeze it, we can actually separate it into two other components. And this is actually uh, the two components that I meant. Eh? So you got your um, your this is a fresh frozen plasma. Before we freeze it, I don't know why it says fresh frozen plasma because we're going to use this back to freeze it later. So the FFP, you can actually spin it again into two components. So the, the, the one that sink at the bottom will be called cryoprecipitate, while the one that is left uh, as water is a cryosupernatant. So the cryoprecipitate, the main advantage of it is it contains fibrinogen. So in DIC, if you're do your fibrinogen level is become very low. So in DIC for hematologists, um, we actually uh, worry more when two things happen before the PT or PTT goes up. Number one is platelet. If the platelet goes down, we know the IVC is around the corner. If the fibrinogen level is already below 2.5, we know that the IC has already happened regardless of what the PT or PTT shows. So this is the time that we actually scramble and we actually give, um, sorry, uh, we actually give more 
um, cardio precipitate if the patient has got low um, fibrinogen level because it contains more or less pure fibrinogen in them. So um, these slides may help us in guiding what are the components. So the cryo precipitate, fibrinogen is the main thing. The volume is actually quite small and also have other components in the final common pathway, including the von Willebrand's factor. So this cryo precipitate is very good when you the PT, PTT is normal, but the patient's still bleeding. So basically the patient lacks fibrinogen. You give this plenty of them. Okay. Usually, if you give six units of price to precipitate, if everything else is okay, you should be able to stop the IC. The cryosupernatin, uh, actually, we use more for uh, reversal of warfarin or in, in plasma exchange when there is actually condition like TTP and things like that. Lah. Okay. Those are the enough pictures already. Lah. <laughs> okay. I like right. the pictures. Okay. So um, there's another question. Sure, sure. There's a few more questions actually. Hmm. Oh, uh, I can read in the chat. Lah. Yeah, you can read, right? Oh, okay. So can you yeah. explain, Rogan, we have done? Serena mm -hmm. asked, what about mm -hmm. autologous transfusion? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there oh, a uh, need to separate the pump? Mm -hmm. And how many days pre-op this one? Yeah, so the actually how long, uh, usually the, the need for autologous transfusion is purely for a replacement of hemoglobin. We then not to separate, and even if we do separate, um, the platelet and plasma are not given back to the patient. Uh, you have to understand that the life, the, the shelf life of the each component is different. So um, pure blood, uh, you can actually give for auto transfusion within ideally about four weeks. Uh, after four weeks, you get lysis of the blood product already, so it might not be suitable for transfusion. So ideally, if you need, um, if you need auto, uh, if the patient is well, I do twice at minus four weeks and minus two weeks, usually with some erythropoietin uh, stimulant. So you collect two pints and then uh, the transfusion, we just give pure blood. The platelet uh, only lasts for five days, lah, so... Uh, usually, you don't. Um, for the, the main purpose of autologous um, transfusion is uh, the volume, the hemoglobin, rather than for the platelet of the for the plasma. So we we do separate them, but the separation uh, back to the patient is just for the pack cell component. The platelet, why waste the platelet? Give it to somebody else, like can. Uh. So can ask. Um... Yeah. Just now you mentioned that platelet can only last yes. three to five days. Unfortunately. Yeah. So what is the average utilizer rate? Yeah. That's that's always the main challenge, lah, because it depends on uh what the center, how active the can uh, the center is in terms of utilization. Um for the the main uh, use for platelet is actually for uh, for hematological malignancy that we use. Uh, we also use it for other emergencies where you need platelet, uh, say in patient with severe dengue and you the patient's bleeding, you need some platelet cover. If you need to put a central line on a patient that is having um, a severe dengue, then you should actually uh, give it. Yeah. So um, sometimes we do give platelet also for patients who need emergency yeah. or uh, who's on an anti platelet. Yes, yeah, yeah, That's definitely. Right. Especially Plavix, you uh, you can reverse them if you are in emergency, because Plavix unfortunately when they bleed, I use a bit susal, so you Some can reverse it by yeah, the platelet. Not... Yeah, so the trick that sometimes I give for patient with uh, with platelet, nah. Uh, sorry, for, for Plavix and all that. Um, it's the activation that's the problem. So in this group of patients, I actually give the platelet a bit drawn out over one hour, one unit over one hour, slow. Because if I give it quickly, it just get utilized, it just get consumed very, very fast. So I tend to, yeah, I tend to find, especially in my patient that's heavily transfused before, if I give platelet too quickly, they get consumed very fast as well. So I tend to give it a bit slowly. There's some paper that suggests that it works, but it's still controversial. But it's not as controversial as the next question, which is anticoagulation used to treat the IC. The, the thinking is actually very novel. In fact, there are 
um, the main study was actually done by the US Air Force. Uh, the US, US Army, when they have obviously landmines injury and all that um, in, in, the, in the fields. So by giving uh, anticoagulation, you, the idea is to actually uh, to stop the progression of the consumptive component of the DIC. But in general practice, um, there were papers from UK, papers from um, from. Israel as well that dispute the use. So me, I tend not to use it. Um, I tend to use other things. Previously, it's also uh, popular in use in postpartum hemorrhages. The Indonesian sometimes use anticoagulation for their postpartum hemorrhage. The, the thinking behind it is you give that, but you don't actually let the patient bleed to death. You still give plasma and all that. The idea is to use anticoagulation to curtail the initial um, um, that catastrophic use or the overuse of the blood product. In DIC, the, the, the main driver is the persistent uh, activation of the coagulation cascade. So the moment you give um, um, any, any uh, plasma, they just get utilized. So if you give anticoagulation, you stop the consumption, and then you have to give uh, another um, the, the FFP of fibrinogen at the back end so that it can still reduce the bleeding. So that was the reason or the rationale behind anticoagulation use. This is a now very this, scary process, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Nowadays, I don't use that. I use either FIBA or I use um, activated factor 7, uh, Novo 7. It works a lot better than anticoagulation in the IC. So again, be, it is not, a, not something that is readily use. available. Yeah, so... It's scary and tend to happen in the middle of the night. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but hey, mind you, we save a lot of life with activated factor seven. It's always very handy. And within half an hour, you stop the, the IC dead on. But so it doesn't work on its own. readily available is this factor seven? Um, in most hospitals, they do. Uh, in... In my hospital, we do. I'm sure in Beacon, I'm sure they have lah. Otherwise, you would tell Hidayat to bring it in. <laughs> definitely, definitely very useful. Yeah, and yes, I think Hidayat. Andre asked the question. Andre, are you there? Oh, yes, Andre, sorry. Andre, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally, I won't use the anti that, that just, I think there are, you know, data. Neither would I. But I yeah. would, this is something out of box. Uh. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's, it's actually in the in the 70s, 80s, that was the thinking, you know. But yeah. now with I'm, the. I'm talking with in the, the context of trauma, actually. Yeah, but, but this now we tend to use... What kind of anticoagulation are you talking about? Oh, they use heparin. Heparin, now. heparin. They use oh, heparin. heparin. This is before we have uh, pentasaccharides or low molecular weight heparin. So this is actually 70s and 80s. But nowadays with FIBA, FIBA used to be uh, available in the 90s. It's a factor 8 uh, bypassing agent. Nowadays with the activated factor 7, it's easy to use. Uh, it's a bolus dose. And if you read the instruction, you can just give it. And the way to mix it is also very straightforward. Okay, any more questions? If not, I want to ask... Okay, of course, Haris is a hematologist. But I think uh, I want to ask Haris a little bit on... Hot, but you seem to... you Bring our conversation one day, you were telling me about your interest in that, right? Mm -hmm. A blood yep. bank. Um, Tell us what are the uses for this kind of pot? Sorry, use of what? Sorry? You know, cord blood, like when the kids cord are blood. Oh, yes, cord. cord blood. Oh, cord blood is, is, a, is a separate discussion. Yeah, there's some part, something that you yeah, yeah, something that you've mentioned to me before. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's I think because I um it's not that it's interest, uh, because I'm actually uh, one of the board member of one of the cord blood company actually and still am and um, it, it's there is actually some 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 use for it definitely but my my belief is actually to be used by the donor itself so basically cord blood is the the special kind of uh, more primitive form of a stem cell so to speak, that is actually present in the umbilical cord 
uh, between the babies and the mother. So after the placenta, that cord, yeah, the blood there is not pure, um, pure matured blood. It has got some hematopoietin poetic um, uh, properties to it, meaning that it can actually differentiate into multiple kind of cells. So the interest comes from the fact that uh, if the baby were to develop childhood leukemia and all that by the age of say three or four, so the cord blood can actually replace the patient's own stem cell bank by actually a form of um, uh, um, transplant. So instead of getting a sibling or somebody else to be the donor of the stem cell with the risk of rejection and all that, they use their own, uh, basically they reset their own factory, so to speak. So that's where the value is. But one unit of cord blood is only good for somebody is 30 kilograms max. So it can only be good for the baby or other babies actually are compatible. So if you were to give it to an adult, one unit is not enough. You need to at least use two or three units. So it's a different kind of discussion. It's not, yeah, it's, we won't consider it a blood product. Um, when we talk about cord blood and hmm. uh, the cells in the cord blood, it's not hmm. equivalent to stem cells, right? They do. Yeah, they do. Oh, they, they have are? actually, they are. Actually, they are even uh, more primitive than the, the hematopoietic stem cell. See. Mm. So they just, can, hence the, the interest of actually changing it into making them all look like Koreans. Huh? So, <laughs> because it okay. just, it can differentiate into many more cell components. Okay, I want to visit to your bank one day. Oh, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> For obvious reasons. <laughs> so, can, I ask, you some, sure, yeah. can yeah. I ask you something a little bit sensitive? Sure. I'm a Go believer on. in conspiracy theory, and I believe mm. we have the technology to manufacture artificial blood, but because mm. of the commercial drive from the American blood, mm. uh, the Red Cross, and that's why we do not produce this artificial mm -hmm. blood, what do you think? Yeah. Well, the, it, it's not something new. Even in the 90s and the, the early uh, 2000s, well, it's a lot of research gone into it. It's actually uh, um, something to make. Um, there, there are two ways to look at it. One is actually to actually use a normal blood component but make it more efficient at carrying oxygen. The other one is just purely something synthetic lah, to actually bring. Um, but... I'm not sure what happened to, to the actual research. One of the main problem that we had, you know, if you go to conferences and they, they tell you about all these things, they actually, a lot of our low immunization. So basically, if you give it once, it's okay. The second time you have some sort of like, not allergic reaction, but it's like an immune reaction to them because everything synthetic, if you give, it's all right to give it the first time. The second time you actually mount a reaction to them, unfortunately. Don't ask me. I'm not. I'm not in that field because all the research sort of like died down after that. I was expecting somebody to be awarded a Nobel Prize, you know. When if it's yeah, yeah, well, I believe that mm. the American Red Cross suppressed this because of the mm. great commercial value from from the normal blood that Ooh, they, they uh, big business, belief, you know. Like, conspiracy. Ooh, this big business. The the yeah. the blood banking is. Whew. Uh, we we over here, yes, the processing and all that, but we don't actually venture much into it. Like, you imagine that what they, how they make money is actually by production of of uh, immunoglobulins and all that. Immunoglobulins and all that actually comes from blood product. It's distilled. Otherwise, we would have actually thrown it away from the plasma. So obviously, you have to actually have a big bank, distill it, and then jual. Okay, Serena has a question. What mm. about Wharton's jelly? Yeah, I must say that I'm not really familiar with its role. Now. What's Wharton's mm. jelly? Can you just mm. explain to us? Yeah, I'm not really sure what they meant. I think that's from the delivery, mm. isn't it? The yeah. Wharton's. Yeah. I'm so, uh, checking now Wharton's jelly. Mm. Um, the Wharton's jelly. Is actually a gelatinous substance from the umbilical cord. Yeah, that's um, well, um, this so not it's... not in my realm, you know. It's <laughs> it's actually more more. No, no, the aesthetics doctors always ask me, but I really can't tell. 
it, so um, I need to read up on this because yes, mm. I have uh, interest in aesthetic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Always trying to make myself look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, okay. Betty. That's that's the whole different discussion. We always <laughs> had this discussion in the doctor's lounge before she, before Betty. <laughs> no, our left discussion us. is always football, but today I'm not going to talk about football. See, I, I was good. Why well, I didn't mention anything about <laughs> yes, football good. so far. And then another the last thing question. Um, sure, about sure. This three or four uh, factor complexes. Uh, mm. Do we really need a four factor complex? Or would three-factor complex be sufficient? Yeah, it's or... quite uh, it's quite difficult now to actually get the four factors in the market. Uh, the one readily available is actually the three factors, and with the presence of activated factor seven, uh, it's easier to use. And the 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 problem with uh, immune reaction is actually a lot less. Mm. Okay. Uh, to answer yep. Serena, Wharton's mm. jelly. Is they are looking into using it for diabetes. Interesting. Mm. Never mind. We will okay. talk about it another time. Okay. So, the, the next question, yeah, FFP and PCC, uh, which one is better at stopping bleeding? Depends on what's the driving behind the, the, the bleeding. Uh, if it's consumptive coagulopathy, meaning DIC, definitely PCC is superior to FFP. But the problem with PCC is not readily available. If you are if you have somebody bleeding in front of you, uh, FFP is the one that you can get hold of pretty pronto. So that's why FFP is more widely used. Obviously, the PCC has got more, um, more activation of fibrin at the end of the final common pathway. So obviously, it's ready. Um, the problem with uh, PCC is if you don't have enough platelet, if you don't have enough of the intrinsic factors uh, of the patient, um, it won't work. So you still need a bit of plasma in this patient. So if you give plasma, plasma will correct your your um, the 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 plasma will actually correct the extrinsic pathway, but when it comes to final common pathway, it doesn't actually work much. So when it comes to final common pathway, you need something to activate the, the, uh, the thrombin side of things. So PCC is quite good at it. It's better than just giving fibrinogen alone. Um, to get hold of it is quite difficult. So FFP and fibrinogen is something that you can get easily in everywhere. So we tend to use those instead. But if the if you have PCC available, then I mean, by all means, please use it. Uh, it won't work on its own. You still need a bit of FFP in, in, to correct the, the patient. In the IVC, you still need the, the primary pathway, which is the platelet. You still need the extrinsic pathway, which is your FFP. And you need the final common pathway, which is your fibrin. So that's why in the triple therapy in somebody with the IVC, you give the three components because you want to attack it in three different pathways. Mm -hmm. If any of you have not checked out the Harris's um, mm -hmm. page or channel yeah. on YouTube, but, Pakadara yeah, but, Adda, right? Pakadara yeah, but Adda. Those, those are actually mainly for, for patients. So, you know, but we, some of them are very detailed. Yeah, because oh, the, the, the details of what the patient asks from me from clinic can be, uh, can be quite interesting thing quite deep and the worry i have is sometimes you don't give all this information uh, when they read in the website they have a different idea about how we go about treating certain things so some some of the subject have to be detailed some of them have to be quite like in coagulopathy usually i don't actually touch that much like, because i mean i don't think that the patient will come and asking for ffp and all that hopefully not la. if the patient bleeding asking for ffp then we know we are doing <laughs> So basically, um, yes, uh, I think it's still worthwhile to check your website out. Sure, sure. You have a About website. Yeah, you have a page. Okay, oh, Facebook, okay. Facebook okay. Page. That's a time for okay, show us. No worries, come in. Yeah, come advertise, in. advertise. Okay. So, okay. oh, before we go, uh, there's a few okay. things that I okay. wanted to touch. Just, just. Oh, yes. Just, um, yeah, because, um, okay. I did, I was in UK between 1990. Uh, between uh, until 1996, you know, by default, I cannot donate blood in Malaysia. You know why? The rule states very clearly, 
No, don't ask me. I didn't make the rule. Uh, if you are um, actually, the word that the PDN uses is permastatin in uh, the UK, the UK Isle, any of uh -huh. the four nations over there, for a period of more than six months between the year of, um, I think it was 1986 to 1996, then you are not allowed to donate blood here. Because of, the, uh, because of the prion disease, the Metcalf disease. I see. Mm, okay. And for if you actually bermastatin outside the UK, but in Europe, the period is five years between those periods. So it is still whole. And I don't think that that's, there's any plan to revise that anytime soon. But whether we adhere to it or not, I'm not really sure. Oh, this prion disease yes. was a big thing when I was doing my MRCP. Of course, yeah. And it, I have not heard about it since then. Uh, because the, I studied the hard on the prion disease and passed my MRCP part one. They show us about it. Okay. The other thing is age. Um, they may say it's age of consent, so 18 and above only can donate. Uh, we usually we cut off the cut off um, age is 55. So above 55, unless the, the patient's really fit and not taking any other medication, then obviously this I cannot Bolela. donate. <laughs> Underlying medical issues, uh, more is not like um, we're worried about the blood product, it's we worry about the patient. Imagine of you've course. got heart problem line from and also the drug that they take so if they they, they take antiplatelets huh, obviously they cannot donate because there will be some interference with our preservative and things like that so the blood product might not be of good quality when we keep we try to exclude them lah. infection if you are happy carrier that's uh, that's a moot point lah. so we just screen everything SCMV in Malaysia we can actually uh, donate but we actually document the CMV status uh, we I think we still check for Zika because that's what the WHO directive actually asks us um, past activities uh, mainly tattoo lah. so if you have tattoo uh, more than 12 a month you're allowed to actually donate if it's fresh within 12 months no, no, but the okay, thing there's is, some more questions. Hmm. So Serena oh. asked whether hospital use tranexamic acid in trauma cases. Hmm. No, that's um we do. Uh, it depends on the individual um uh, uh, individual uh, uh centers. The main worry about using tranexamic acid is there is actually uh some paper that suggests it may accelerate the the in increase the incidence of the IC because you activate one of the pathways but um, there's no issues using it as far as I'm concerned as long as you're giving transfusion a bit later on. Tranexamic acid is actually a platelet aggregator so um, there are certain circumstances where you should not give so if the patient had got trauma around the bladder site um, you know they will get hematuria they will get a clot in the in the bladder, so better not use it. So I think maybe Andre can actually tell us a bit more. Um, in terms of the, the hematologist's point of view, we utilize it a lot. Uh, I think it's mainly for pre-hospital, and I think mm. it was based on the crash trial. So mm. it's recommended, but it, you should also top it up with a initial dose. And I can't remember mm. how much you have to give uh, within eight hours after that. Yeah. But the it's main point is always to stop the bleeding. So yeah. transamic is just a uh, bridging towards yeah. definitive treatment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. I'll tell you a secret, okay? Mm. I use a lot of transamic acid. For pigmentation. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah, Betty, Betty. Okay. <laughs> That's what the the the, the dermatologist prescribed to me. That's why oh, I look course. so young. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Ken says. Doctors are not eligible for blood donation because we all got, we, I think don't we should get make enough. a rule. Have to be eight eight hours sleep before we donate. <laughs> then only we can. <laughs> I think it's not because of work. Most times it's because we are on our phone. <laughs> it's not. Or football. <laughs> no, no. I don't even follow football. I don't want to read about it at all. <laughs> okay, lah. I think I better call it the night. Yes, we better call it a night. Yeah. Thank you so much, Harris. Hey, no problem. And it's then I think, fun, uh, huh? yes, of course, anyone who comes to my webinar, one thing for sure, they always say it's fun. Because um, I am fun. 
<laughs> audience are fun. <laughs> My audience is fun. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Sorry about the mess I made. Yeah, mm. it's actually my fault. I just tell you why la. Yesterday was, uh, basically, I want to see my mom la yesterday. <laughs> no, because, because today uh, is MCO. Yeah, MCO, and she's actually in in Kajang. So, I don't want to be si Tanggang ma. Have to la go yeah. and see mom. So what happened was I didn't know that when I set this, it would erase my my post my Zoom. So yesterday I have to resend everybody to say that it's today. I didn't manage to resend this Zoom link. Mm. Anyway, we yeah. do have uh, we did get a lot of people coming in, um, fifty almost fifty people. So I think um, maybe we can give another session next time again. Sure. Oh, Sarah okay. Banan asked oh. to. Can I know oh. your website and YouTube? Okay, okay, okay. I I about about. Oh, hang on, hang on. Oh yeah, yeah. Lucky yeah, share. Thing. Luckily, they tell you. Any okay. advertisement, I must ask you, you want to, to cannot la, charge me. La. <laughs> okay, so wow, so that prepare banyak, ni? of course. Ah, do no, no, it's just nothing much, la, but, but, uh, but patient in you know, dot com, you know, of a global company. No, I'm still, I'm going to take over the world. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Thank hey, you, thanks, everybody, Betty, for hosting. Yes. Okay, thanks. See you, Harry. Okay, anything, you can just email me or just Facebook yes. me. Lah, and we'll have a chat. Okay? Take care. Yes. Bye bye. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye thanks, bye, Harris. Thank you bye -bye. so much.